Well, any day is a great day to be thinking and talking about gardening. And I know spring is one of those especially fun times to think about it. And it, maybe you're thinking about what you're going to get done this year. You maybe have some questions about things that happened last year. Well, this is your opportunity to get some answers to your questions. Hi, I'm Sandy Mason. I'm with the University of Illinois Extension. And I know I have a really long to-do list, and I'm pretty sure all the panelists do too on all the things that they're going to be doing this spring. And, and of course, we'll get right into giving you some ideas on the different types of things that are going on right now in your garden. Uh, be sure to give us a call and contact us if you have some questions on gardening. And we have uh, Tom Voigt with us. Uh, what kinds of things are you going to cover Hi, Sandy. Um, my name is Tom Voigt. I'm an extension specialist and uh, turf specialist uh, at the University of Illinois in the Department of Crop Sciences. I work with other perennial grasses as well. And I've got some uh, cool season perennial uh, lawn weeds to, to show you. They're uh, all actively growing now and all can be controlled with post-emergence herbicides at the present time. Uh, first one I want to show is is buckhorn plantain. Buckhorn plantain is a uh, very indicative of low maintenance settings. It's a, it's a, a weed that uh, indicates that you probably need to fertilize a little more and, and up, up your management in your lawn. It's characterized by long strap-like leaves with parallel venation. Uh, I'm wilting a little bit here, but the, the uh, flower is, is this bullet-shaped uh, seed head at the top of the stalk. A relative of that is, buck, or is broadleaf or black seed plantain. Uh, similar leaf shape, only more oval and shorter. Uh, again, uh, we find these in lower maintenance lawns uh, uh, at this time of year, uh, and they are actively growing. And then the third one I'll show in this segen, seg, segment is dandelions. Dandelions, everybody knows uh, dandelions. I'm, uh, we have the yellow flowers, uh, we have the windblown seeds uh, uh, at uh, this time of year as well. Uh, controls for these are post-emergence broadleaf herbicides. Generally, we would want to want to use a, a mixture of more than one herbicide, uh, such as 2,4-D and mecaprop and dicamba mixed together, for example, uh, because each of these weeds uh, may be better controlled by one or another herbicide. Uh, and by combining the herbicides, you're going to control a broader spectrum of weeds as well as um, uh, as well as uh, control weeds that maybe none of the individual products would control. It's always important to read, follow, and understand the label instructions on any herbicides that you do use in your lawn. They should be sprayed when they're actively growing, and these are all, all three of these are actively growing now as we speak and can be uh, controlled uh, with a broadleaf herbicide okay. spray. Okay. I know the name of my lawn now. It's called a low maintenance lawn because I have all <laughs> those. <laughs> I have all those. Uh, so, but it's interesting you talk about that. So, some, sometimes actually in Increasing fertility is a first, way to sort of first, take care of some of these? First line of defense in any lawn care uh, program should be mowing properly and, and fertilizing properly. We'd mow two to three inches uh, and fertilize uh, usually at least two pounds of N per thousand per square feet per year and probably three is better. And if you irrigate in the summer, four, uh, per thousand, four pounds per thousand square feet. And that allows the turf to be more competitive with the mm -hmm. weeds than mm -hmm. it would be under, under lower management conditions or mowing way too short or, or not mowing at all. Right, right, uh, right. So mowing and fertility are your first line of defense against weeds. You should use herbicides only when those other uh, cultural activities are, aren't giving you the quality you'd like. Okay, good point, good point. Thank you very much, Tom. And Kelly? You have pretties. We I do. Pretties. I have very pretties. Hi, my name is Kelly Olsup and I am a horticulture educator. I serve Livingston, McLean, and Woodford counties. My expertise is um, indoor house plants, uh, greenhouses. I uh, love uh, insects, but especially I love pollinators. And uh, actually, this is a plug for Sandy's program. I am building a pollinator garden, mm -hmm. and she has developed these really cool designs um, called pollinator pockets, where it's really easy. It tells you exactly what kind of plants to plant. So I used some of her designs with some native perennials and a few non-native cultivars, but I love planting annuals. Um, because it's all season long color and the butterflies and the bees absolutely love it. So I have here, right here, this pink one right here along the stem is called Angelonia, summer snapdragon. 
and it is very, very easy to take care of and blooms all summer long. The other one on the other side is called Egyptian star flower. Um, also, pentas is the um, scientific name for it. And it also is very easy to um, uh, grow, it just tolerates a lot of drought. But you look at the little tiny flowers, that's something that bees and butterflies absolutely love. And then, so, and then, you know, pink. I wanted my garden to be a little pink. <laughs> So for the pollinators, pink is good. we like pink. pink so I'll be like adding pink. both these into my pollinator garden. So that's nice. To, so people can know that you know, even if you don't have a big garden or flower garden, you could do containers or whatever to help out pollinators. So that's always good too. You so don't have to have a big plants. garden; just a little tiny and, one is fine. And I think the other thing I always mention is just the fact you don't have to give up on having nice, pretty gardens and pretty containers and stuff just because you're thinking about pollinators or whatever. Yeah, so that's good. My pollinator garden last year was beautiful. Okay, thank you very much, Kelly. And Jim, you always have, you know, like not so good things oh, no. to talk about. I mean, good, but maybe not so good. I don't well, know. I'm, I'm a retired plant pathologist, yeah. and I love your job. tree diseases. Yeah. Now, I think a sick plant is a lot more fun than a healthy one, so oh, I'm, I'm kind of warped that way. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I've got two different diseases, and they're both showing up now on uh, your crab apples and even your apple trees. The first one here is called frog's eye. And it is caused by a fungus that normally causes cankers on the tree trunk and branches. But on crabs, or apples, or mollusks, uh, it also causes a leaf disease. And this happens to be just called uh, frog's eye. And then we have apple scab, which is the most common one you find on crabs and apples. And it also attacks the fruit. And you can see I've got a crab apple here, but I also have it on the fruit of the leaves, I mean the fruit of the apple tree, or mm -hmm. an edible apple. And it, this is where it's got the name scab, or apple scab, because when it's sporulating, and it sporulates within a few hours after starting, um, it looks like a fuzzy scab. And um, the, mo all, both of these diseases will cause uh, your leaves to fall off and can, um, one nice thing about it, it does not necessarily affect the edible eating of the apple. It does affect the selling of it, but it doesn't affect you to eat it. You can just peel that apple off, or the skin off that apple, or if you don't mind, you can eat the scab. It's not going to hurt you. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't look appeasing, but you can just ignore it. But the difference between the two leaf diseases is that frog's eye has a very distinct margin in the spring and early summer, and apple scab has a diffuse margin. Uh, so it looks fuzzy, but by August, the, both of them are going to be, be very difficult to identify because the apple scab diffuse margin becomes a very distinct margin, and so um, you know, hopefully you've, got, you've controlled it by then. Now there are several fungicides that work on these two diseases, but Captain works on both of them all season long, uh, and it also is the only one that's for the edible apples. Okay, so if you're growing a regular apples or you're, you're growing large crab apples for eating, you're going to want to use caftan. But other fungicides that you can try, and if these other ones, um, the fungi may become more resistant to it sooner than um, the caftan. Caftan has been around for 40, uh, almost 60 years now, and has never had a fungus become immune to it because it kills in so many different ways. But the other ones that have more of a single application for killing the fungi are calcium polysulfide, chlorophyllol, potassium bicarbonate, sulfur, and I'm not sure I can pronounce this last one correctly, but it's T-E-B-U-G-O-N-A-Z-O-L-E. -E. And you start these uh, soon after the leaves have come out of the bud, and you continue on the crab apples uh, at least until uh, two weeks after the petals have fallen off. On the edible apple, you can continue uh, spraying all the way up until you're several weeks uh, in front of the harvesting time. Okay, great, great. So this is one of those things you have to protect the plant against disease. These are, right. This is on apples and crab apples, yeah. both. And it, those, I know sometimes those names are really tough to remember or whatever, but people can check with their local extension right. office or in the new book, Pest Management for the Home Landscape. Uh, that's where we get this kind of information on how right. you can control some of these diseases. So thanks a lot, Jim. You're thanks. welcome. And uh, before we get to the calls, we actually have a Did You Know video. Hey, did you know? 
Although ozone in the upper atmosphere protects us from ultraviolet rays, ozone in the lower atmosphere is harmful. Scientists monitor ozone with plants like black-eyed Susans, which are sensitive to ozone. I had no idea. Actually, I didn't know that one either. Black-eyed Susans, sensitive to ozone? Who knew? Hmm. Uh, at, we're going to get right into our callers. And on line two, we have Cindy that has a, a caterpillar on a rose. I'm thinking you don't want the caterpillar on your rose. Is that true, Cindy? Yes. Um, I have an old rambling rose that actually goes probably 10 feet down my fence. And every year at this time, it gets these tiny little green caterpillars on it. And this year, it's really, really bad. It's almost defoliated half the bush. And I sprayed it twice with BT, um, that Vaxillus serengetis or whatever. Um, and I noticed yesterday that the caterpillars are not dead. Now, the BT is from 2015, so I'm thinking maybe it was too old. Or is there something, should I get an, a newer BT from 2016? Or... Uh, is there something else I can use? I'm trying to be organic because of the bees, mm -hmm. but I'm afraid to use something specific. <laughs> I'm so frustrated. Um, my first guess is a rose slug. Yeah, I'm thinking it's actually not a caterpillar. Yeah, not a caterpillar. And that's why the BT didn't work. And so, <laughs> I mean, I would not. I would yeah. definitely not use a systemic pesticide on my roses yeah. because then that could potentially hurt the bees. But maybe um, if neem oil or spinosad um, are labeled for roses and for that particular problem, that would those would be good alternatives. So I would not spray BT on it anymore because I think you don't have a caterpillar. Yeah, yeah. And um, they go away. Yeah. Um, but. Um, I would use a different type of chemical, so spinosad or neem oil. Yep. So that's a good, a, a BT is a great product, but it is specific to caterpillars. Yeah, it is. So these happen to be, it's a sawfly larva. It's really mm -hmm. not uh, a true caterpillar, even though it looks like a caterpillar. You'd have to get out your hand lens to really tell the difference and who's going to do that. So that's fine. But I almost bet it's rose slug. I would yeah. agree. Okay. Very good. Thanks. And we have a, another caller, uh, Larry, I believe, that has a question about potato beetle. Larry, are you still there? Did we lose Larry? Yeah, I, uh, last year I had a little problem with the Colorado potato beetle. And I tried different remedies for it, and none of them seemed to work. And I was wondering whether you might have a, a remedy that would possibly work on those little rascals. Mm. <laughs> what do you think? I'm, I'm, I'm very organic. So one of the things I absolutely love doing is using um, exclusion. A lot of organic growers will do this and they'll cover their crops with um, a polyfiber um, and it just excludes it. And so they'll do it for the first five or six weeks of growing that crop, whether it be squash, and they'll just cover it. It's kind of like a frost cloth, a, um, um, a low tunnel almost, where you're just excluding that pest altogether. Um, but as far as other things, um, uh, the, I know that Colorado potato beetle larva does not like plastic mulch and if you mm -hmm. were to mulch around some of those potatoes with plastic mulch um, that might deter it a little bit uh, it is actually one of the really cool bug cool bugs one of the only mm -hmm. bugs in the industry that people are actually releasing a lot of um, beneficial insects on and they're releasing soldier bugs to take mm. care of these Colorado potato beetles. Um, I know you know you can find soldier bugs um, in, on the website, but um, I would do more, um, I would exclude them. And I think I've actually had master gardeners, I tell them exclusion, 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 that's the way you can be <laughs> organic. And in the beginning, they didn't believe me, but now they've tried it and it really works. Just, you know, having those plants be healthy and protected for the first five or six weeks of their life. 
Yeah, and that's one of those examples because with this being on potatoes, we don't care about pollination on them. It's different, you it know, is. if it was tomatoes or beans or something like that. But with potatoes, we don't need the pollinators to, to pollinate them So in order to have a crop. So exclusion, actually just covering them with these floating row covers and stuff actually works quite and well. And the, the reason that the industry has chosen to use beneficial insects is showing you that there's pesticide resistance yeah. with Colorado potato beetles. So that would certainly be one thing to look for is actually to, and, and most garden centers cover, you know, will have those floating row covers mm -hmm. or frost protectors or whatever. It just looks like material. But yeah, know, fabric. I'm, yeah, just check with your extension office and if you do want a chemical recommendation, they would be able to find it in the book for you. Yeah, yeah. very good, good. Thank you very much. So hopefully that helps. And on line five, we have George who has some volunteer cottonwood trees. And again, maybe you don't want those. I'm thinking, George, lots of little forest of trees. Uh, yes. Hi. Hi. You had a question about cottonwoods? Uh, mm -hmm. We've got some ground in a government set-aside program and getting a lot of volunteer cottonwood trees. Mm. I've been mowing them down, but I'm wondering if there's a better way to control them. So volunteer cottonwood trees... Mm. What do you think? Well, there's probably some brush control herbicides. Mm -hmm. that, uh, are you growing, George? Are you growing grass and trying to, in your set aside ground? Is it? Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, there's probably some broadleaf uh, brush controls that uh, are available that might be sprayed to uh, uh, to control the cottonwoods. Uh, although I, I'm that's out a little out of my ballywick, so I'm not uh, positive. But there are brush controls that. Uh, uh, we'll work on other, at least other woody plants, and so I would. Uh, in my own lawn, I'm getting little seedlings, you know, 20 to 30 every time, almost every week coming up, and I just use a broadleaf herbicide to help kill the regular weeds, and they mm -hmm. take them out pretty good. Okay. And, you know, only when they're small, though. Right, right, when right, right, when they're small. Because I, I, I know we had a lot of times we get questions about people with the uh, maple trees. You know, all the, mm -hmm, little, the mm -hmm. silver maples are coming up in their lawns sure. or whatever. So, so, but mowing does help. Yes. I mean, if you can mow, because most of the time they're, they're not very good. You know, well, once they get, as long as they're, again, as long as they're young, you mowing helps. You may not want to mow the set-aside ground frequently enough. Yeah, to yeah, to that may be the problem. Right, yeah. right, right. So herbicide might be an issue for you. So hopefully that helps a little bit. So, okay, thanks. And Sue has a question about alliums. Are you wanting to hopefully grow them? So, Sue, you have a question? No problem. I have an uh, allium, which I've had for several years, and they've been beautiful. And they're beautiful this year, but I seem to have about three times as m many as I had last year. They're coming up in clumps. Oh. But along with that, I have a bigger problem. I have dozens and dozens, literally, clumps of what appear to be wild onions. Mm -hmm. Is there any connection between the two? Well, alliums are a type of onion. There's only a type of onion. And we do see uh, wild garlic and wild onions as lawn weeds. Uh, um, uh, wild garlic around here would probably mm -hmm. be a little more common than wild onion would be. And I believe the difference is wild garlic has a solid leaf and wild onion has a hollow leaf. Uh, um, and. Uh, we would, uh, they're difficult to control because you have a very skinny leaf and you have, have uh, it's got wax on it and getting enough herbicide in to kill the bulb becomes very uh, difficult, but an ester form of 2,4-D might be something you could try. Again, read, follow, and understand the label instructions when you're using any of the pesticides we're talking about tonight. And ornamental alliums or ornamental onions will reseed themselves. I have had yeah. that happen before. And actually, one of the little plants that I brought that we were talking about for one of our rounds, it also kind of comes up and it look when it first comes up with these leaves, this is Star Bethlehem, when it first comes up with these leaves, it actually looks almost like an ornamental, uh, almost looks like a, like a wild onion or something like that when it first comes up. So I actually kind of wonder if maybe you're not seeing Star Bethlehem, but right now they're starting to flower. So that would be the other thing. So it sounds like you may have a couple different things going on there. So unfortunately with some of those, uh, you know, wild garlic and stuff, you actually have to dig, your best bet is to dig them in landscape beds. So I know that's just really, really tough. Or are we, I don't know, we learn to love them? I don't know, can we do mm -hmm. that? Mm -hmm. Hopefully it helps you a little bit. Uh, we're, we're a Sue, so uh, we're actually gonna go ahead and do another round of, I know you have some more plants and, and emails to go through. So Tom, you have a? 
I've, I've got three more cool season perennial weeds. Again, perennial means they come back year after year, and there's some structure that allows them to survive our winters. Uh, and I apologize, these were, I harvested them this afternoon and they've, and they've dried they out. Yeah. Uh, cl white clover is a really uh, common, this year, uh, white clover is a weed that seems to thrive under cool, wet conditions and in the spring, as well as in low uh, nitrogen fertility settings. Um, uh, it, it was a part of most lawn mixes until we had chemicals that would control them. Uh, um, and they've become less desirable now uh, in some lawns. Uh, white clover is a leg it fixes nitrogen or it's able to take uh, grows in by a uh, relationship with bacteria in the soil that takes uh, able to take atmospheric nitrogen and convert it to a plant available nitrogen so if you look at your clumps of white clover you'll oftentimes see the turf around it being a darker uh, green and growing more rapidly than than the uh, um, uh, turf away from the clump. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mechaprop uh, or uh, the broadleaf uh, uh, broad spectrum three-way mix will control that. Probably the weed that I get the most calls about is ground ivy or creeping charlie. Uh, this is a cool, again, a cool season perennial. It's a, in the mint family. It's got a kind of a funky foul odor about it when you when you crush it. Uh, it starts in, often in the shade, but it'll, it'll tolerate full sun. It's quite difficult. It's easy to damage. It's hard to c totally <laughs> control. Uh, herbicides uh, don't translocate through it very well. So it, it, and it spreads by both above and below ground stems. Last. Last cool season uh, weed that's uh, going great guns now are wild violets. Wild violets are have a heart-shaped leaf that's kind of uh, the lobes are uh, kind of off, off uh, sh they're, they're not even evenly shaped uh, at the base of the plant. They were flowering about a week and a half or two weeks ago. They're pretty much done flowering here in, in central Illinois right now. Uh, this is one of the, this and ground ivy are probably two of the harder to control weeds in the lawn. Um, if you have access uh, or your lawn care operator has access to a product called triclopyr, um, Lontrel, uh, that's probably a good herbicide for, for both of those uh, weeds, your or your best shot at controlling them. And again, read, follow, and understand the label when mm -hmm. you're using any of the pesticides we're talking about. Okay, very good, Tom. And uh, Kelly, I think you have the email question, right? I do, I have an email question about Osmocote uh, for hydrangeas daylilies, which are both perennials. Um, Osmocote is a slow-release fertilizer. Uh, can she put it on the perennials? Well, the way Osmocote works is that first it absorbs water and then according to the temperature, it breaks down. So if she, she asks if it's too late right now, well, the temperatures have been really, really cold. So if she would have done it maybe two or three weeks ago, uh, it wouldn't have broken down anyway because it's too cold. So it's the temperature makes the slow release start to um, release. But before, uh, if you osmocote or do a slow release, only do it one time a year because most perennials do not need a lot of fertilizer. And in fact, you know, just two times a year is enough for them, maybe in May and then again later on if they're a late bloomer, maybe another one in July. But um, constantly fertilizing your garden would um, cause very leggy growth. So if you do an osmocote treatment, do it one time in the spring. And then if you do uh, you know, liquid uh, feeds, you do it twice a year. And then you, know, you could always just uh, add some compost. Right, absolutely. I'm big on compost. You know, as a plant pathologist, I like people when they over fertilize because it makes all their plants more pro yes. disease prone. <laughs> no, we don't want that. We don't I want don't that. want my perennials to fall that. over. Okay. <laughs> okay, and actually, we're going to go to the phone lines. Uh, Dan on line six has a question about erosion control and some plant IDs. Ideas or IDs. So, Dan, you had some questions about erosion control on line six? What are some good erosion control? Does anybody have some ideas about erosion control? Maybe some good? A lot of grasses. Uh, grasses are some, good. Uh, make uh, good erosion controls. Native uh, grasses are, are quite good. Uh, um, and 
usually you'd want to have uh, buffers uh, near w surface water mm -hmm. where the grasses might be cut at different heights with the taller grasses closer to the water and the and, and stage down or step mm -hmm. down as mm -hmm. you get into the lawn height grasses. Okay. And then even if, if they have uh, maybe some space, some height, they can allow some height, maybe some mm -hmm. grow sumac or some mm -hmm. of those that actually sucker up, maybe some small shrubs, those yeah, kind of things. things that so spread by underground stems. Yeah, anything so. that mm -hmm. sort of suckers up and grows by underground stems, that might help. And I'm dying to know, uh, Bruce on line two has a question about fish head fertilizer. <laughs> I don't know, are you for it or against it, Bruce, on line two? Yeah, um, my uh, father used to fish a lot, and uh, okay. he, would, yeah. he, would take, he would take fish heads and bury them in the garden. <laughs> And um, I, think I think that's. He was thinking that it was using, it was like enriching I, the soil. Yeah, and I'm afraid we're going to have to run. I think that's great. You know, fish heads. Why not? You know, it's Squanto. a type of organic. Yeah. Type organic. Of, yeah, as long as the raccoons don't go for it, that would yeah. be the biggest problem. So we always have good questions, and uh, we love having your questions through email or however you want to contact us through phone. We love it, and it, this is a great time to be thinking about gardening. So thank you all very much for being thank on you. here, and I hope you all have a great week gardening. I know I'm getting out my to-do list and thinking about it, so hopefully you are too.